Welcome to Weather Extra. I'm meteorologist Jillian Grace. Thanks for joining us today. We have a lot to cover on this week's show as severe weather ramped up across the nation. But before we get into this week's top weather stories, it's Easter. So happy Easter to you and your loved ones. And since it's Easter, let's dive into Central Texas's Easter climatology. Now, Central Texas has a normal high of about 76 degrees on Easter. Now, the normal low is about 53. And this year, we weren't too far off from that. We did manage to stay just a little bit cooler than our normal. But now on to the extremes. The hottest temperature on Easter was actually back on April 16th back in 2006 when we got up to 95 degrees. Now the coldest temperature was 30 degrees back in 1937 on March 28th. Now there's only been two Easter's that have actually featured below freezing temperatures. Now as far as rain goes, so only three years ago back in 2020 is when we had the wettest Easter on record when over an inch and a half of rain fell. That was back on April 12th of 2020. Now there have been 41 Easter's with precipitation and only one of those Easter's where it snowed. But let's get ready to dive into this a week's top weather stories and science stories from right here in Central Texas to across the nation. And there's a a lot to unfold. We begin weather extra today by covering the past a few weeks severe weather outbreaks that have taken place across the nation. Powerful storm systems have been sweeping coast to coast, bringing widespread severe weather, proving that spring is truly the most active time of the year for tornadoes. Since March 31st, over 30 people from eight different states have lost their lives due to tornadoes. Let's take a look at some of the destruction these twisters have left behind. Back to last week when March came to a close and we sprung into April, a widespread and deadly tornado outbreak impacted the Midwest, deep south and eastern parts of the United States. The outbreak started off with a large EF3 tornado tearing through the metro area of Little Rock, Arkansas, where a tornado emergency was issued as a twister inflicted significant damage to numerous structures, killing one person. In an hour and a half away from Little Rock, another EF3 tornado killed four people in the town of Wynn. The twister tore through the local high school. Thankfully, kids were dismissed early with the threat of storms in the forecast. A violent long track EF4 tornado tore through Martinsburg, Iowa. This would be the strongest tornado of the event and would go on to create significant damage to homes and trees and also injured two people. Another EF3 twister was reported across western Tennessee and Covington. That tornado also brought disastrous scenes and ended up taking the life of one local resident. Another tornado was reported in Tennessee, killing nine people in McNary County outside of the Memphis area. Although this was one of the weaker tornadoes reported that day, an EF1 twister tore through Belvedere, Illinois, collapsing the roof of the Apollo Theater. Over 40 people were injured and one died. Another destructive EF3 tornado killed six people when it struck across parts of Illinois and Indiana. Hazel Green, Alabama also got hit by a destructive EF3 tornado on April 1st, where one person was killed and numerous homes suffered significant damage. As the storm system moved onto the east coast, additional destructive tornadoes tore across the northeast. In Sussex County, Delaware, an EF3 tornado killed one person. This twister is the largest ever on record for the state and the second EF3 tornado since records began back in 1950. During the severe weather outbreak back on March 31st into April 1st, over 120 twisters ranging from EF4 to EF0 were reported, along with a total of 27 fatalities and over 120 injuries. In this past week featured another multi-day deadly tornado outbreak across the nation. The outbreak spanned across 1,000 miles from the Great Lakes down to the Mid-South. Several more tornadoes were reported last week as the storm system swept coast to coast. An EF3 tornado with winds up to 160 miles per hour blew through Lewistown, Illinois this past Tuesday evening. At least four people were injured in the twister. Power lines were down, homes demolished, debris scattered everywhere. And a high-end EF3 EF2 tornado brought catastrophic damage across parts of southeastern Missouri early Wednesday morning. At least five people have died in Glen Allen, where that powerful twister left behind widespread damage. Over 80 buildings across the town were damaged, with a dozen completely destroyed. Strong storms also caused the death of a man in Louisville, Kentucky, as a large tree fell down onto that man. An EF1 tornado reportedly moved through the city, tearing through an apartment complex, displacing more than 50 residents. 70 plus mile per hour wind gusts from thunderstorms also knocked out power to thousands. 
And the same storm system that brought that round of severe weather across the nation this past week also brought a significant early April winter storm. The National Weather Service warned this could be the biggest snowstorm of the year for the Northern Plains. Take a look. Last Tuesday, millions of Americans were placed under winter storm alerts as a powerful storm system tore across part of the country. Blizzard warnings were in place for more than 800 miles from Wyoming to Minnesota. Areas under those warnings would go on to see as much as 20 to 33 inches of snowfall. The snowfall winters were across parts of Wyoming and South Dakota, where nearly three feet of snow fell in just a few days. Travel was impacted across the numerous states as ferocious winds combined with heavy snow. Whiteout conditions ended up shutting down interstates as numerous crashes and spinouts were reported. Look at this view in North Dakota on Interstate 94. A no travel advisory was issued for the eastern part of the state last Wednesday. The blizzard dumped several inches of snow and then the powerful winds created large snow drifts. One local state trooper described the snow drifts as crazy deep. Heavy blowing snow was seen in parts of Minnesota too. These forceful winds managed to knock out power to thousands. And further down south across Utah, heavy snow and strong winds also led to power outages and hazardous travel. Officials across Salt Lake City saying this storm brought some of the highest snow totals they've ever seen in the month of April. And the cold wintry weather also continued across Colorado. Ice accumulated on roadways, creating slick driving conditions. Up to half an inch of snow fell in the Centennial State. While December and January are typically the snowiest months for most across the United States, a few places in the country see the most snowfall while many Americans start to thaw out thanks to spring's warmth. Millions of Americans across the northern and central Rockies and up into the high plains see more snow in April than any other month of the year which is exactly what happened last week. And California was also part of the group that saw additional heavy snow last week. This comes on top of an historically snowy start to the year. For more than a decade, California dealt with a severe drought, but this winter's repeated storms have wiped out those dry conditions. A new report shows just how remarkable the snow totals have been for the Golden State. California's Department of Water Resources is now out with its April snow survey. The report shows the snowfall totals this season are among the largest on record. Here are some of the eye popping numbers south of Lake Tahoe, a Officials measured uh, a snow depth of 126 and a half inches. Snowpack in the Sierra is 20 or excuse me, 221 percent higher than normal. Uh, then also there into the Mammoth Mountain recording over 300 inches and statewide the figure is 237 percent higher. This year's April 1 result from our automated snow sensor network is actually uh, greater than any other year that we have recorded uh, since the uh, snow sensor network was deployed roughly in the mid 1980s. Switching gears and turning back to a more festive topic for today. In this week's moment of science, Dan Smith is celebrating the incredible edible egg and how great they can be for us. They're a staple of many diets at breakfast time and many colorful displays at Easter time. Let's get cracking and serve up some facts about eggs. An important note to lead off, we are just looking at unfertilized hen eggs today. No baby chicks involved, no matter how cute they may be. Okay, let's face it, they're pretty cute. Let's start with the shell. It's made of semi-permeable calcium carbonate, and that means air and moisture can pass through its thousands of tiny pores. They're only about 10% of the total weight, yet under perfect conditions, eggs can hold up to 130 pounds without breaking. You get enough of them in a row and you can even walk on them with a great amount of care, mind you. The membranes just below the shell help combat bacteria. Then you get to the egg white or albumin. That helps to cushion the yolk from being jerked around. And the calaisi are those stringy bits at each end that help keep the yolk centered. And yes, they're as safe to eat as the rest of it. An air cell forms at the larger end since the contents contract when cooling more than the shell does. Finally, the yolk itself has most of your fat, vitamins and minerals. There's some debate over this, but the yolk of an unfertilized egg is technically just one cell. And an ostrich egg would have the largest single cell on Earth. Shell color depends on the breed of the hen that laid it. There's no real nutritional or taste difference between white and brown eggs if they're all raised under the same conditions. Freshness matters more than color here, and if you drop one in room temperature water and it sinks, well, there's your fresh test. Yolk color, however, depends on the hen's diet. A single egg also has a little under 200 milligrams of cholesterol, and while the USDA recommends capping your daily intake at about 300, they're still good for your overall health. 
This one might surprise some. Gram for gram, egg yolk has more protein than egg whites. However, the yolk is where all the fat is, so it has four times the calories. You can still argue the whites are a bit healthier. We're going to save all the cooking facts for a later date this summer, since we'll also explore that age-old question, can you fry an egg on the sidewalk on a hot day? There's one that doesn't always go over easy. For this week's Moment of Science, I'm Dan Smith. Straight ahead on Weather Extra, we hear from meteorologist Sean Bellafuri, who has more information released by the National Hurricane Center regarding a powerful storm from last year. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Weather Extra. The National Hurricane Center recently released their post-storm analysis on last year's deadly hurricane Ian. To bring us more on what new information was released, we turn to meteorologist to Sean Bellafuri. Sean. Now that we are past, I guess, Easter, it is time to talk hurricane season. Only 53 days away. Of course, last year the big headline was Hurricane Ian, a category, well, now five storm that eventually made landfall in Florida. And here are all the hurricane season tracks. Honestly, a very slow season considering we didn't really see much activity until we got to late August, September, and October. But of course, there were a couple of storms that had devastating impacts across the uh, the Atlantic Basin. These are the hurricane season list, or this was the list for 2022. Hurricane Ian, now it originally was a Category 4, just like Category 4 Hurricane Fiona, but reanalysis over the past couple of months has led to an upgrade. Ian, at its peak, was a Category 5 storm. Another year with a Category 5 hurricane. It feels like we're almost getting these year after year recently. This, of course, is the track of Hurricane Ian, and when it did make landfall in Florida. It moved ashore as a category four storm, but hurricane hunters, they were flying through the system leading into landfall and right around eight o'clock Eastern time. There was uh, data that was sent back in real time to the National Hurricane Center with 161 mile per hour winds. Now in real time, the hurricane hunter data was flagged as unreliable, but reanalysis has shown that it actually was. Now, just in this short window between strengthening to a Category 5 storm and making landfall in Cayo Costa at 3.05 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, the wind speed did drop about 10 miles per hour, coming ashore as a Category 4 storm. But we have some big changes upcoming to this hurricane season, uh, of course, starting in less than two months. The first change, which doesn't really happen until a couple of years, comes from the World Meteorological Organization. Uh, the hurricane committee has officially retired Fiona and Ian from their list of rotating names. 2028 is the next time this name list is going to show up and they're going to be replaced by Farah and Idris. But the Hurricane Center itself has been pretty busy behind the scenes too. A couple of days ago they came out with their update on the products that they're going to be issuing for this hurricane season. First off, the peak storm surge forecast graphic is going to become operational. You've probably seen a show Showing this uh, type of graphic showing how much storm surge along coastal regions can be seen and before this year it was considered experimental but now this year it becomes fully operational. I do also want to point out the other big change uh, that's coming this hurricane season and that is to this the tropical weather outlook. You've seen something like this or from us you've seen kind of a similar graphic and now this graphic showing where potential hurricanes could form used to only go out five days but now that has been extended to seven days. We'll have more on the upcoming hurricane season coming up, of course, over the next couple of weeks. Reporting in the studio, Sean Bellafuri, KWTX News 10. After the break, we have this week's Degrees of Science with Chief Meteorologist Brady Taylor. Well, we'll learn more about the research being done on all things hail. Stick with us. In this week's Degrees of Science, Brady Taylor sits down with Christina Gropp, who works for an insurance institute for business and home safety. In this week's episode, get ready to learn more on the damage hail can cause to your personal belongings. Here's a peek into their conversation. What kind of damage do you all see when it comes to some of these big hail events that roll through? Sure. Well, starting with about half inch hail, that's when we can start seeing damage to crops and vegetation outside. So it doesn't have to be very big, 
to start seeing some of that damage. Now, would we get up to about an inch and a half sized hail? That's when we start to see more damage to cars. And inch and a half up to about two inch hail is when we start to see damage to our roofs. And that's a big focus for us at IVHS is the impact of hail on roofs. When hail hits a roof, it can dent shingles, it can tear shingles, and it can displace those protective granules that are on your shingles as well. So those are the three ways that hail damages that roof. Once we see hail even larger than that, you get up to the gi giant stones and the gargantuan hailstones. Those can even come through your roof deck and into your house if uh, you're not careful with, with some of those bigger stones. Once we add in the wind, wind driven hail is yet another way that hail can damage our homes and businesses. We can see damage to siding. We can see damage to air conditioning units outside, windows, just about anything that's outside could be damaged by hail, especially wind driven hail. What have y'all learned from looking at those hailstones and comparing it to the radar data and what the radar is predicting the potential of hail, how that correlation is between what you're finding and what you're seeing on the radar? Yeah, so radar is pretty good at detecting hail, especially now that we have dual polarization radar. That has led to a lot fewer false alarms. But what we have seen is that radar generally overestimates the size of hail, especially sub-severe hail. Once you get up to these larger stones, like the one that fell in Salado or in Hondo, that's when radar starts to even underestimate the maximum size of hail. So it really varies based on the size of the hill that ends up falling. And we also see that, that radar struggles with the geographic extent of a hail swap. What kind of research and work are y'all doing in the lab to continue to learn about hailstones as well? So all of our field work informs what we do back here in the laboratory. When we started our lab here and built this facility back in 2010, we wanted to replicate hail in the lab, but there wasn't enough data. That's part of why we started the field program was to collect that fundamental data on the properties of natural hailstones. And now that we have the largest research grade data set of hailstone measurements, we're able to realistically recreate in the lab, lab manufactured hailstones. And that allows us to do testing against like roofing products in particular. That's a big focus of ours here at IBHS is how hail impacts roofs. So we take the data from the field we manufacture hailstones here in the laboratory, and then we test them against roofing products so we can take a look at what impact resistant shingles actually live up to their label as being impact resistant. For anyone that's been out with hail, it can be all different kind of sh shapes and sizes and odd looking shapes like that. Do y'all take that into account when y'all make the artificial hail so this, see how that impacts stuff? We tend to keep all of our hailstones right now as spheres in the laboratory. We're starting to explore some more of those unique shapes, but all of the other properties of hail, including its hardness, which is a, a unique one, we keep that mimicking what it, we see out in the field. So hailstones are a lot different than the ice that comes out of your freezer. They're less dense than that. And we mimic those properties back here in the laboratory. So what we are testing roofing products against is just like what falls and hits your roof. Catch this to hear more on their conversation, uh, Brady and Christina's conversation about research being done on hail. Scan the QR code on your screen or to watch on YouTube or go to kwtx.com slash degrees of science. Weather Extra returns right after this. Welcome back to Weather Extra. NASA made an exciting announcement last week. Three Americans and one Canadian are the lucky astronauts selected to circle the moon next year. Dania Bacchus has more on this historic deep space mission. Ladies and gentlemen, your Artemis II crew. Applause thundered inside the Johnson Space Center in Houston as NASA tapped three men and one woman to head to the moon. Mission specialists Christina Cook and Jeremy Hansen, pilot Victor Glover, and Commander Reed Wiseman will embark on a 10-day journey circling the far side of the moon. Am I excited? <laughs> Absolutely. The four-person crew includes the first woman, the first person of color, and the first international crew member on a lunar mission. 
Together, they'll become the first to fly NASA's Orion capsule. Orion looking back at Earth as it travels toward the moon. An unmanned Orion completed a test run last year, capturing incredible images from space. Artemis 1 was a resounding success, and Artemis 2 will leverage that by putting humans in the loop. This is the first moon mission since Apollo 17 back in 1972. The Artemis 2 crew will not land or even go into lunar orbit, but instead pave the way for future space exploration. It is the next step on the journey that gets humanity to Mars. Yeah, you can clap for that. That's big. As the crew told CBS News, it's an enormous responsibility. We will have the eyes of several nations, the world on us. Um, we have all of our friends in the astronaut office. We don't want to let them down. We want to make them proud. We are proud. The mission is scheduled for no earlier than November of next year. If this moonshot is a success, NASA hopes to land astronauts on the moon once again by 2025. Don Back is CBS News, Los Angeles. And NASA and SpaceX launched a rocket early Friday morning from the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. It's equipped with a NASA instrument called TEMPO, which stands for Tropospheric Emissions Monitoring of Pollution. The device is a, the first space-based device to monitor major air pollutants from above. It can monitor conditions from the Atlantic to the Pacific Oceans as far north as the Canadian soil sands and also as far south as Mexico City. And from space exploration to the deep depths of the ocean, take a look at this. Scientists have recorded fish at the deepest layer ever. Now, as you can see, last September, a sea robot filmed this snailfish just above the seabed off Japan at a depth of 27,000 feet. Scientists also physically caught two other fish at 26,000 feet. That's a new record for the deepest catch. The fish have tiny eyes, a translucent, a translucent body, and also a no-swim bladder. All right, well, that's all we have for you for this week's Weather Extra. We hope you all had a wonderful Easter. Tune in again next Sunday for another half hour of weather and science. Until then... Have a great week.